Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Welcome to the Jack Joseph and Morton Mandel School of Applied Social Sciences and the second of our Centennial Research and Training Colloquia series. I'm Elizabeth Tracy, faculty member and associate dean for research and training at the Mandel School. We are a very diverse group gathered here today. I want to point out that we have two co-chairs of the Centennial Committee, uh, Denise Gibson and Kathy Farkas, who didn't know they were going to be named, but <laughs> there they are. <laughs> we also have a number of students, both master's level and doctoral students. We have alumni. We have faculty. We have field instructors. We have research staff and associates. We have community practitioners and administrators. We represent the social work profession and the Mandel School well. A warm welcome also to our viewers connecting remotely. The session is being live streamed and will later be posted on the website, which is why when you ask a question, we will have a runner who will run this microphone to you. A few logistics. Restrooms are to the right in the lobby. If you're a student, please make sure you sign the sheet for professional development hours. If you've signed up for social work CEUs, Einer Brand will have your certificate in the lobby area at the end of today's session. And some well-deserved thank yous to Helen Menke in the doctoral program, to Einer Brand, Maria Sharon, Tracy Brandon, who is monitoring our uh, email for people connecting remotely to ask questions, Nora Hennessy, the Associate Dean for Institutional Advancement. All of these people have helped with this series. This colloquia series is co-sponsored by the Office of Research Administration and the doctoral program at the Mandel School. And at your seat, you will find a complete list of colloquia for this academic year. We are pleased and proud to note that all speakers in this series are graduates of the Mandel School. I will mention that more than once. Today, we're happy to have with us Amy Krenzman, who earned her PhD from the Mandel School in 2008 and Lou Lamarca, a 2012 MSSA graduate. Each speaker will present for about 50 minutes. There'll be time at the end of each speaker's talk for questions, and I will be the timekeeper today. For those connecting remotely, you can email questions to mandelschool at case.edu during the question and answer time, or really at any point, and Tracy Braden will run up the question at the appropriate time. At 5 o'clock, we'll invite you to the lounge area for our reception and informal time to interact with the speakers. At your seat, you're going to see a more detailed biographical statement for each of our distinguished speakers. And in the interest of preserving time for the speakers and for our CEUs, my introductions are very brief. Our first speaker, Amy Krenzman, is an assistant professor at the School of Social Work at the University of Minnesota and an adjunct research investigator in the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Michigan Medical School. She received her Master's of Social Work from New York University and her PhD from where? The Mandel School. <laughs> her talk today is three good things, mixed methods, research, gratitude, and addiction recovery. Our second speaker, Lou Lamarca, is the clinical director of Community Assessment and Treatment Services here in Cleveland, and an adjunct faculty at the joint MSW program at Cleveland State and University of Akron. And I note that some of his students, he's made it a requirement to connect remotely, and so we will have some CSU Akron students with us today. He has a bachelor's degree in psychology from the University of Akron and an MSSA from the Mandel School. His talk today is three more good things, protective factors, the recovery model, and knowing how to interpret research. Please join me now in welcoming our first speaker, Amy Krenzman. Thank you for that kind introduction, Dr. Tracy. It's my great privilege to be here. Um, again, my name is Amy Krenzman. I'm an assistant professor of social work at the University of Minnesota School of Social Work and a proud alumna of the Mandel School. Before I get started with my presentation this afternoon, there's two things I'd like to do before we really get roll up our sleeves and get into the research. First and foremost, I want to wish the Mandel School a happy birthday. <laughs> 
happy birthday to this wonderful school that has served so many students so well and for the wonderful people who run this, run this school and make it happen. This is um, me and my two colleagues, Kerry Belden and Stacy Barker, on our graduation day. We started the program on the same day in June of 2003, and we finished together in May of 2008 with our PhDs. Thank you, Mendel School, for being my alma mater, for the friends I made, for showing me what I'm capable of, and for enabling a career that is deeply meaningful and gratifying. Thank you. I've been asked to say a few words about the state of alcohol and alcoholism 100 years ago when the Mandel School was just opening its doors. Things were kind of grim for someone with this disease back then. You see a photograph here of a group of men who, by helping each other, were able to arrest their alcohol problem. This picture was taken 125 years ago. The notice at the top of the picture says, the law must recognize a leading fact. Medical, not penal treatment, reforms the drunkard. These are themes and topics and debates that are still raging today. I'm going to very quickly um, sh tell you about three systems, three movements, uh, three institutions that were alive and well 100 years ago related to the problem of addiction. The first is the Washingtonian movement. They operated inebriate homes in Boston and Chicago. Inebriate homes were just simply buildings like the one you see here. This was their Chicago facility where people with alcohol problems would enter and basically uh, uh, get locked in and stop drinking. They had all kinds of innovative methods, for example. The Appleton home in South Boston simply undressed the arriving patient, put him in bed, and hid his clothes in order to prevent flight. Things were um, grave and um, uh, uh, desperate in those times. The homes also provided physical, psychological, and spiritual services, and the idea of mutual aid was part of the Washingtonian movement. The idea that one alcoholic could help another and that they could both stay sober was part of what was happening with that movement, and in that way, there was the precursor of Alcoholics Anonymous, which didn't come around until 1935, right here in the state of Ohio in Akron. Another institution from 100 years ago is the Keeley Institute. Okay, the Keeley Institute had a potion for you to take. That was Leslie Keeley's double chloride of gold cure for the treatment of alcoholism, drug addiction, and the tobacco habit. You could take this by injection or oral tonic, and you could go to the Keeley Institute and remain there for three or four weeks, or you could mail order the substance to your home and ingest it at home. The over 500,000 people were treated in this ma manner, and the formula was never revealed. Historians, no one knows what was in that cocktail, if you will. Um, the, the established medical community of the time did not look favorably on what was going on with Ke the Keeley Institute. They didn't think it was uh, such a great thing, and it had no medical evidence. Um, However, it was, it was a, a for-profit initiative and it was very successful. However, they did put forth, the Keeley Institute did put forth that alcoholism is a disease that could be cured. They saw it as a medical problem. So in that way, there was this kernel, this flicker of, um, of, of hope for some, an idea that could help us in the future. The last institution I will talk about is prohibition. In, um, in 1916, uh, 100 years ago, when the Mandel School opened, opened its doors, we were at, in the lead up to the prohibition. Uh, the idea behind prohibition was that the problem was the substance, not the person, that a person could have a, a, a vulnerability to drinking alcohol, but in fact that um, the problem was the substance. And if we made the substance illegal, it would help the social problem. And the social problem was the problem of women and children who were abandoned as the result of alcoholism, as a result of, their, uh, of the husbands, the fathers, you know, getting absorbed into the saloons, in the saloon cu culture and drinking, and leaving the family destitute. But again, there was the glimmer of something we still use today, which, is, which are policy interventions to help reduce harm. So we have a legal drinking age. We have uh, policies designed to address 
people dr driving under the influence. We have policies related to alcohol outlets, where they should be, when they can operate. So the idea of policy to help us with the problem of alcoholism is still an idea that's here today. Now we move on to the main um, purpose of, our of my talk this afternoon, which is my presentation of this research that I have done. Um, uh, the study I, I will be presenting is just out in press this month. It's the lead article in the Journal of Positive Psychology, and the study is entitled Feasibility, Acceptability, and Impact of a Web-Based Gratitude Exercise Among Individuals in Outpatient Treatment for Alcohol Use Disorder. Now, if I were up here, if this weren't the anniversary of the school, if this weren't a special occasion, I would be up here and I would present this research study to you in the normal way that you always hear research studies presented. We would talk about the introduction, the methods, the results, and then we'd have a discussion about what it all means. Every research presentation follows this format. But since we're here to celebrate, since this is a, a holiday, really, and an acknowledgment of the birthday of the school, what I'm going to give you is a backstage tour <laughs> of what really goes on behind the scenes in a research study. And as a metaphor, a working metaphor for us throughout my, uh, lecture, the balance of my lecture, we're going to think about this idea of going backstage. The image on the slide now shows someone in the very, very back of the stage of an opera house, and you can see straight through to the rectangle that the audience sees, and you can even see the seats beyond. But within the stage itself, you see that there's an awful lot going on back there. It's very high, it's very wide, there's all, this th all these things that are happening backstage, and the public only sees that rectangle. And, and this is the equivalent of that. This is all the public sees. They don't see what happens behind the scenes. If you read this paper, here is what you would learn. That we tested a gratitude intervention among individuals in outpatient treatment for alcohol use disorders. That this was a randomized controlled pilot study. That the gratitude group experienced improvement in mood versus the control group and that qualitative interviews confirmed this finding, that gratitude in, the gratitude practice improved mood, and added the additional discoveries that the gratitude practice improved cognition and reinforced recovery. When you design and conduct a research study, it's kind of like um, this uh, is a, do a doodle. This is, I took all the words, all the text of my published study, and I ran it and created a doodle online. This is what it looks like. TGT, most prominently in the corner there, is, stands for three good things. The three good things exercise, which was the intervention in the study. But when you design a study, there are a multitude of problems that have to be solved and decisions that have to be made. What I basically wanted to do here was, um, in the positive psychology literature, there were interventions designed to help people improve their mood and decrease depression and basically increase well-being. But none of those interventions or uh, practices had ever been tested for people with addictions. Um, I wanted to do that. I wanted to apply what they were doing in the positive psychology field and apply those interventions to people with addiction. So I knew I wanted to do that, but I didn't know which interventions I would use, how long the person should practice the intervention. I knew I wanted it to be a web-based delivery, but I didn't know who the participants would be, whether I should have a control group, or what my primary outcomes should be. These were all questions swirling around my mind. And believe me, you want to get, the, you want to get it right. The decisions you make in this stage, you want to make the right decisions. And you really, um, there's a lot of debate that goes on, discussion, you get advice from your mentors, you talk to people you admire, you talk to colleagues. Um, I talk to research assistants who are even undergraduates uh, or, or graduate students, I, and you really try through discussion to, to um, make the right decision for, for all the questions and answers that you need before you organize your study and get it off the ground. So um, taking you on this backstage tour, the first thing we really had to ask ourselves is, um, uh, is there a, um, a reason to do this study? Does it make sense to do this study? Put another way, is there a theory for this study or why it might be important? 
So the, the real first question was why apply positive psychology to addiction? Well, positive psychology is the study of wellness. Um, oftentimes there is the symbol of the compass to describe what positive psychology is all about. It's my favorite metaphor for explaining what positive psychology is all about. They say that um, if you're working on an in intervention that helps a decrease pathology, you're helping someone go from a deficit position to a neutral position, but the realm of positive psychology is what they call the area north of neutral. How do you get people from neutral into a stage of wellness? Positive psychology is concerned with well-being, flourishing, positive organizations, positive interventions, optimal functioning, positive affect, and character strengths. And the place for positive psychology to fit in the discussion of addiction, in my opinion, is in the phase of addiction uh, that is the phase of recovery. So if this arrow represents the lifespan of someone with an addiction, then each box represents a phase of the illness. And we know for each person that the length of each phase varies. And for some people, they don't enter all of these phases. But there's a pre-addictive phase, an active addiction phase, a treatment intervention phase, and then for those with the optimal outcomes, there's a recovery phase. And we know that for many, the recovery phase can last many, many years, even decades. And the recovery phase has its own subset of phases, an initiation phase, a stabilization phase, and a maintenance stage. So where positive psychology can have an application to addiction is during the recovery phase for the following reasons. Helping recovery become more positively reinforcing is a relapse prevention strategy. If we can help people in the phase of recovery to, to, to improve in their lives from that baseline to, to north of neutral, improve well-being in their lives, then the price of relapse will be driven up. A good life in recovery drives up the cost of relapse. Positive psychology is dedicated to the study of wellness, to taking people north of neutral. And here is where um, positive psychology interventions can be applied among people in addictions, in addiction recovery, to, to improve uh, the way things are in recovery and, and um, make them resistant to relapse. And this idea was prevalent in the addictions literature, although no one had ever applied uh, positive psychology to addictions before the work that I, I and my colleagues have done. In Alcoholics Anonymous, there is the idea that life in recovery should be positive. Um, several scholars over a period of decades have said that pleasurable indulgences and rewarding activities should substitute for substance use in the service of relapse prevention. And again, people talk um, in terms even of behavioral economics that the, a positive life in recovery could drive up the cost of relapse and make it too expensive, too pricey, a price that people would not want to pay. So there we have a theoretical rationale and idea, something that seems to, to, to ring true for why we should apply positive psychology to addiction. So as I had mentioned, there were several different uh, um, inter positive psychology interventions that had already been tested among psychologists, among healthy people. So but for my study, one of my decisions was which positive psychology intervention should we test? And as you can see, each transition slide is what? It's a picture of what happens backstage, right? So here, here the people are climbing into their costumes. Which positive psychology intervention should we test? Of all of the different positive psychology interventions in the literature, um, which one am I going to use for the first study of positive psychology's application to addiction? There's the you at your best uh, um, intervention, which is where someone thinks of a time when they were at their best. There's the best future self intervention, when you imagine an ideal future and you describe it. Um, there are exercises related to determining your character strengths and then putting those strengths to use. There's um, research on acts of kindness. 
that if a person um, um, initiates acts of kindness, that they uh, end up with feeling, feeling better, feeling better about themselves. And there are a series of gratitude practices. So this was the array of positive psychology interventions that had been tested and shown to reduce depression and increase well-being among samples of individuals who did not have addictions. And the question that we faced was, which one are we going to use to test the first one in, in a, a sample of people with addictions. What do you think our answer was? It was gratitude. It was kind of an easy choice because gratitude and recovery go hand in hand for many people. Gratitude is a prevalent theme in recovery circles. Gratitude is a, a, a prevalent theme in AA literature, Alcoholics Anonymous literature. It's embedded in the 10th step which asks that members on a daily basis express gratitude for blessings received, among other work on a daily basis. And Bill Wilson, the, uh, co one of the co-founders of Alcoholics Anonymous, he wrote pr prolifically about the topic of gratitude. Here is a quote from Bill Wilson. I try to hold fast to the truth that a full and thankful heart cannot entertain great conceits. When brimming with gratitude, one's heartbeat must surely result in outgoing love, the finest emotion that we will ever know. And you know that we feel outgoing love for the Mandel School. <laughs> <laughs> but so we decided gratitude, but then we had to ask ourselves, well, which gratitude practice should we use in this study? Because there were more than one. There were three. There was, uh, you know, that positive psychologists had tested the effect of making gratitude lists, the effect of gratitude letters, write a gratitude letter towards someone you're grateful for and then read them the letter, and then something called the three good things exercise, where individuals are asked to look back over the past 24 hours and think of three good things that happened and then why they happened. Well, we decided to go with the three good things exercise. First of all, the word gratitude was not part of the three good things exercise. And I thought that might be a benefit because some people bristle at the idea of gratitude. If I say to someone, um, make a gratitude list, it's almost like I'm saying to them, be grateful. You know, uh, people can take, take, it back, uh, take, take offense to that or it, it may um, just slightly rub them the wrong way. So this was neutral. It was also something that could be done on a daily basis, whereas a gratitude letter was kind of a one-shot deal. And it had more structure around it than a regular gratitude list. So that emerged as the winner. It had been tested in the positive psychology literature and shown promise. So we knew then that we were going to test the three good things exercise among individuals with addictions. But we didn't know what the, out, the primary outcome for this study should be. What should be our primary outcome? Should it be drinking? Should it be well-being? Should it be depression? And what we decided to do is use theory to determine that the outcome should be mood. The primary outcome for the first pilot study of this nature should be mood. There's a theory called the broaden and build theory of positive emotion. And this theory posits that positive mood, even brief and fleeting moments of positive mood, end up building to an expansion of psychosocial resources. And it does this because when people feel a little bit better, a little bit more buoyant, a little bit um, happier, they may take a risk. They may talk to a stranger. They may uh, um, try something new, a new activity. They may uh, make a new friend. And those are resources that can build to more lasting wellness and well-being in their lives according to this theory. And if we take this theory and apply it to the question at hand, we kind of have a path model whereby the gratitude exercise would increase, you know, theoretically in, increase positive emotion, and that would result in an expansion of psychosocial resources, which would lead to an improved life in recovery, which would reduce relapse. But in, we're not going to test this whole path model in our small pilot study. We're just going to test um, the effect of gratitude on, on mood. So um, mood became the dependent, dependent variable. However, that's fine. But then you have to decide, how are we going to measure mood? What instrument are we going to use? And which aspects of mood are we going to assess? So you may be. Um, familiar with the circumplex model of mood. It's, it's a model of mood where mood is divided among four uh, quadrants. The upper quadrant are all highly activated moods. 
On the right, you have your activated positive mood, uh, feeling euphoric, elated, energized, stimulated, int interested. Um, and on the bottom, you have unactivated mood. So unactiva unactivated positive mood is feeling content and serene, calm and at ease. Activated negative mood is feeling anxious, annoyed, angry. And unactivated negative mood is feeling tired and bored. So what we decided to do was to test the effects of the gratitude exercise on negative mood and also on activated positive mood and unactivated positive mood. And it's the first study I'm aware of that tested the effects of a positive psychology intervention on two dimensions of positive mood, activated and unactivated, feeling stimulated and energized and feeling calm and serene and at ease. We tested those as separate outcomes. Then a major question we had in our study that we wrestled with, I remember you know, long phone calls uh, late at night to try to get to the bottom of this, should we include a control group? Because it's perfectly legitimate in a, a pilot study to not have a control group and to just test the intervention, see if it's feasible, see if it's acceptable, see if there's a change in key constructs and not have a control group. That's perfectly acceptable. You would just track mood for one group. But if you saw improvement, you couldn't be certain that the improvement was because of the gratitude exercise, because many other things could be responsible for improvement, especially among people who are in uh, addiction recovery, where there may be many other reasons why they are experiencing improvement. So here were some of the pros and cons that we debated about making this decision about having a control group or not. So improvement could come from many sources in addition to the gratitude exercise. So a reason to have the control group would be that it would strengthen support for causation. It would strengthen the design of the study so that we could more securely say that the gratitude practice was responsible for any change that we saw and not something else. So it seemed like it would be worth it to do it. Then you'd have two groups to compare, which is kind of straightforward and nice and clean. And it's a wonderful idea in a pilot study to have a control group because that's good practice for a larger version of the same study in the future. You can get the kinks out, get the bugs out, see how it works for you, if there's anything you would change before you really are spending a lot of research dollars to really test it with a larger sample. And then there's always the question, well, why not? Why not have a control group? You know, we're going to all this effort anyway. Um, it, let's see what happens. You know, there's really a sense of curiosity and a sense of wonder and a sense of suspense. How is this going to turn out? You know, I mean, I'm a social scientist, and I sometimes imagine myself wearing a white lab coat. Like, who knows? Let's try it. Let's see what happens. You know, that really is part of uh, of, of what research is like. What are the cons? Why should we, maybe we shouldn't do a control group. It's harder, it's more complicated, it's more time consuming, and it prompts even more questions and more uh, problems that need to be solved, such as, if we include a control group, what if anything should we have them do? Should it just be like a wait list control or should it be a treatment as usual control? What is the treatment group gonna be up to? If we include a control group, should they be tasked to do a sham exercise, that is, some kind of exercise where they're also answering questions, but not anything that would change their mood at all, but at least it keeps them busy in the same ways that the people doing the gratitude exercise are busy, and it also reduces, it, uh, um, it improves internal reliability for the study. So should we have the control group do a sham exercise? Well, the, pro, the pros are that the groups would be equivalent in every other factor except for gratitude. So then if we saw improvement in mood, we could be as certain as we possibly could be that that improvement was, was because of the gratitude exercise and not because there was some benefit to writing, like writing has been shown to have some benefits on mood, or being in a research study, having researchers interested in, in what you're writing, that could have a, a, an impact on mood. It would, again, even strengthen even further support for causation. Um, and also, the, why should we do it? Well, let's try it and see, see how it works. Let's try a sham condition and see if it works for us. And why not? All right, we're going to all this effort anyway. Let's have the most rigorous study we can design and just see what happens. The risk is that you have no, no significant results. You know, but we were like willing to take that gamble. 
Why, why shouldn't we do it? Well, it is harder, it's more complicated, it's more time consuming, and it prompts even more questions, such as what should the sham exercise look like? Well, what should we have the, those sham, the people in the control group, what should we actually have them be doing? Now let's look at what the three good things exercise looks like. So this was delivered by the internet. So people in the treatment group went online, every day they got an email, they clicked on the link, it opened into a Qualtrics survey, and we asked them a few questions, and then they, we gave them six, you know, text boxes, like open-ended text boxes into which you type as much as you want, what, that we're all familiar with from different um, interactions with, with, with webs, with the web. So we asked them in one text box to describe the first good thing that happened in the past 24 hours. In the second text box, what was its cause, what made it happen, and then describe the second good thing that happened in the past 24 hours, and why did it happen, and then the third good thing that happened, and why did it happen. So they were presented with six open-ended text boxes to type into. So we wanted our sham condition to do the same thing. We wanted the two conditions to be equivalent in every single way except for gratitude. We wanted both groups to go daily to online surveys. We wanted both groups to fill out six text boxes. We wanted the instructions to be the same, and we told people in both groups, provide detail. We would like to hear about detail. We wanted them to get paid the same for the same type of tasks. Um, we wanted them both to have the function of looking back over the past 24 hours and we wanted them to write about it, and we wanted them both to write about content that would vary uh, every day. So in the positive psychology literature, there was a sham exercise, describe the furniture in your living room. But that would not work for this, because every day, presumably, the furniture in your living room would be the same. We need something that would vary on a daily basis. We wanted something for both groups that, yet at that time I was at University of Michigan at my postdoc, and we wanted them in both groups to think and to think and to know that Michigan researchers were going to watch what they typed and be very interested in what they typed. And we also wanted both to be related in some way to health and well-being. So what would we have as our sham condition? And I think basically at Michigan, I just asked, I think I basically at one point just stood in the hallway and everyone who walked by, I said, um, what do you think we should have for a sham condition, you know? <laughs> And finally, someone walked by who was a sleep researcher, and she said, how about sleep hygiene questions? And, you know, make some very, very neutral questions about sleep hygiene that are not uh, uh, hypothesized to have any effect on mood. So this is what we came up with, these six questions. The placebo group answered these questions over there on the right-hand column. When and where did they sleep, doze, or napped in the past 24 hours? Please tell us about that. Fill that, you know, type, about, type in about that. When did they exercise? Um, uh, and what time of day was it? When did they consume caffeinated products? And what did they consume? When they were sleeping, was the TV, computer, or lights on? And what did they do the hour before they last fell asleep? And what did they do the hour after their final awakening? So this, is, this served as our sham exercise. So that piece of the puzzle was in place. We moved on then. Where will we find our participants? This was the easiest question to answer. We were upstairs in the research suite. Downstairs was an addiction treatment program. We would recruit our patients right from downstairs. They were within the same health system. We shared the same medical record. The patients, when they came for intake, it was a face-to-face -face interview. Um, so they knew where to come. They knew where the building was, where to park. It was familiar to them. And the clinicians downstairs were very willing to help us with recruitment. So that was easy. And this is what the sample ended up looking like. We had 23 participants in the study. They were an average of 46 years old with an average of 16 years of education. About half were female. 82% were of European American background. About half were married or cohabitating. They had high levels of AA attendance and low levels of depression, anxiety, alcohol craving, and drinking consequences. They looked more like a, a treatment sample after treatment than a pre-treatment sample. And that was because we recruited anyone from downstairs in the treatment center who had alcohol as a primary um, concern. It didn't matter to us how long they had been sober. And so there was a wide range of days since last drink. 
Then the question, should we collect qualitative data and make this a mixed method study? So first of all, we knew that when they typed their three good things into the computer, that that was data we would capture. And I had that in mind right from the beginning. I want to see what their three good things are and do a qualitative study about what we find related to the three good things. But then the idea was that we'd also interview people after the whole study was over as a final wave and ask them about their experiences in the study. So there's a rationale for mixed methods. And that includes triangulation, which is to confirm quantitative findings, and comp complementarity, which is to extend or enrich our current understanding of the phenomenon. And those were the two reasons we chose to include qualitative data. Besides, it would bring rich, evocative images into the study, such as this, this patient's description of a good thing, finding raspberry Pop-Tarts at Walmart. This is actually what one person wrote in, typed in as their good thing. I love raspberry and I love Pop-Tarts, but I've never seen raspberry Pop-Tarts. This made my day. With qualitative data, you actually have mouth-watering uh, data that you, can, uh, that you can include and talk about. And the, the, I, love, um, I love quantitative uh, analysis, but I don't know that any numbers have ever made my mouth water. <laughs> so when we're going to interview these people after the study, I wanted to interview only the people assigned to the gratitude condition. You know, I really, that's what I had in mind. But my brilliant research assistant um, said to me, why not also interview people in the sham condition, too? And so we had to answer the question, who should we interview? Um, at the end of the study, and I was persuaded by her idea, which was to in also interview people in the sham condition. And what we learned by that is that they didn't realize, the people in the sham condition didn't realize they were in the control group, and that there were similarities between people in the treatment and in the control groups. And what we found is both groups told us that by assessing their mood, by rating their mood, which was our primary outcome, they found that actually helpful to their recovery. This was a completely unexpected finding. And so we wrote a paper about it that got published, Alexithymia, Emotional Dysregulation, and Recovery from Alcoholism, Therapeutic Response to the Assessment of Mood. And we, we used data from both people in the treatment group and the control group in order to write that paper. Um, the curtain is about ready to come up. The audience is here and assembled. We're ready to show the results. So um, the graph that you see on the left, um, on the x-axis, we have time in days. The other question we had is, for how many days in a row would the people do the gratitude intervention? And we decided 14 days. Because in the positive psychology literature, they had done the gratitude practice for seven days. And we thought, since this was a clinical population, we wanted to reinforce the behavior a little bit longer and have them do it for 14 days. Um, on the, on the y-axis, on the left-hand graph, you have negative affect, and green is the gratitude group. And um, the uh, beta coefficient, we, we did multi-level modeling, that is change over time in multiple waves of measurement of mood. Every time they filled out the three good things exercise, we assessed mood immediately afterward. And for the, the gratitude group, negative mood significantly decreased. It was significantly different than zero. Um, now, over here on the right-hand graph, we again on the x-axis have time in days. And on the y-axis, we have unactivated positive affect. That is feeling calm and at ease and serene. And here again, the green is the three good things exercise, the folks in the treatment group. And their uh, feelings of unactivated positive mood increased over time significantly. And that interaction was statistically significant. So here we have quantitative evidence that the three good things exercise improved mood. It decreased negative mood, and it increased unactivated positive mood. It helped people feel more calm and serene. It had no impact whatsoever on activated positive mood, helping people feel stimulated and energized and excited and all that kind of thing. No effect at all. Our qualitative data triangulated our findings. That is, it confirmed that people felt that the gratitude exercise helped their mood. People use words like optimistic, proud, good, happy, better, lighter, motivated, hopeful, more positive. It gave them a pick-me-up um, in relationship to the exercise. There was also complementarity because the qualitative data extended what we found in terms of mood and also um, showed us that 
According to our participants in this study, the gratitude exercise improved their cognition. It brightened their way of looking at the world. To look for something positive every day takes me out of the negative thinking about the world. I'm not looking around and thinking everything is screwed up. Looking for a sunny day and appreciating it instead of a cloudy day and I caused it. It keeps my head in another place. Also in terms of complementarity, we discovered that for some, the gratitude exercise reinforced their recovery. One participant who was only giving himself credit for benchmarks, like every six months of sobriety, he'd give himself credit. Well, with this exercise, he was giving himself credit for sobriety every single day. For several in our study, when we asked them, OK, there was the good thing. Now, why did it happen? And um, for several in our study, they said, I always felt like I was falling back on, well, because I am in recovery. That was pretty much the answer every time. So they were intoning every single time they filled it out. Why did that good thing happen? Because I'm sober. Why did that good thing happen? Because I'm in recovery. And that was um, a way to verbally reinforce that recovery was a good thing for them. So in summary, we tested a gratitude intervention among individuals in outpatient treatment for alcohol use disorders. This was a randomized control pilot study. The gratitude group experienced improved mood versus the control group. Qualitative interviews confirmed this and added the additional finding that the gratitude exercise lent improvement to cognitions and reinforced recovery. With that, I'd like to thank my fantastic supporting cast of research assistants and thank you for your kind attention. I didn't even have to hold up my five minute uh, thing. We have time for uh, questions and I think Nora will, will carry this around. Just raise your hand if you have a question and Tracy's looking online. You said this was a pilot study. Are you looking to repeat it uh, in any way? And in what way will it change if you do? It's an excellent question. We would like to repeat this. We would like to seek funding to repeat this with a larger uh, sample, larger, more, more diverse sample. We did such a good job of planning. And, and every decision was so well thought out. You know, I give credit to the, my collaborators, uh, my mentors there's very little we would change. Everything worked very, very well. The Qualtrics uh, worked extremely well um, as a way to capture the responses. Um, I don't think I would, uh, I really don't, don't think I would change anything, just a larger sample. Amy, what were the instructions to the groups okay. in terms of why they thought you were doing this? Yes. It was called the daily life study and that we were interested in the daily lives of people in treatment for alcohol use disorders. And they were instructed that every day they would get an email and inside the email would be a click to a link that would open up a survey and they would fill out the survey and answer the questions. Now, when they came to our offices for the baseline assessment, I met them face to face, we did the informed consent and they actually sat at a computer in the room with me and they filled out the baseline uh, um, assessment all online while I was sitting with them in the room in case they had questions. So they were already familiar with what the web survey looked like because they did it for the baseline. And then after that, I would, I would, assign, I would randomly uh, assign them to which group and I would tell them, these are the six questions you'll be asked to answer on a daily basis for 14 days. And I'd let them read the questions. You know, what was the first good thing and why? What was the second good thing and why? Or else the sham questions, they'd read them. I'd say, do you have any questions? They'd say no. And I would say, what, what's most helpful to us is detail. I'd say that to both groups. Any questions? No. Here's your Visa gift card. You know, it'll get, you know, money will be loaded on it based on your participation. You get paid as you participate. The more you participate, the more you get paid. There was even a bonus if they did more than 80% of the, of the, of the waves. And then, um, then they, they walked out. Yes? Did you know which group they were in? I did. Yes, I did. If you did it again, would you do that? Maybe yeah. I would um, remember that you asked me that question, and I'd send you an email, and I'd say, do you think I shouldn't? <laughs> shouldn't know? So yes, when I walked in, um, because we used a, a table of random numbers in order to randomize, and we did, we did paired randomization, so we'd end up with the same number in each group. And when I walked in, I knew, 
I knew which group they were going to be in. And, and you know, they tell you in school that that's going to foul things up, that that's going to bother you. You think that's ridiculous. It won't bother me. I'm going to be the same to everyone. And you do feel, you, you do have feelings when you know what group they're going to be in. Sometimes you really like the person and you want them to be in the treatment group because you feel that's going to help them. I want that for this person. You know? So you do feel emotionally uh, um, swayed by what group they're going to be in. But we stuck, we stuck to it. We, we didn't switch it out you know, or anything. We just tried to be as neutral as possible. But, but you, 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 you know, you, you, your question prompts a, a good idea for the, for the next uh, phase of the study. Yes? Do you anticipate any difficulty in getting your N up to 100? I don't think so. Uh, our participants were very eager to be in the study. I mean, we, we paid them, but they were interested that this study was going to help other people. You know, we told them we are going to publish these findings, we're going to talk about these findings in conferences, and we, we hope and trust that our findings will help other people who have gone through what you're going through. And that motivated them, I believe, more than the money. Of course, we didn't ask about that in the follow-up. I think we would have no trouble um, getting, uh, getting even more par people to participate. What happened is we ran out of time, even before we ran out of money, and we ran out of participants. By then, we had mined all the people who had primary alcohol in the whole um, clinic. And what we would have to have done is wait until a new person with alcohol primary came in and then recruit them. And if we had more time, we could have kept on going, but we had to end it there. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Are you going to do any follow-up after a year or some period of time? We don't have plans for this study to, to follow up over time. Yeah. I'm sorry? There's no plan with this study to follow up over time. I noticed that your sample is majority white. Yes. And I was wondering, first off, is that normal for your area? And secondly, if uh, you have any plans to include a wider diversity in the, in the big study? Sure. It, is, um, it was a reflection of the people who, who attended that clinic. And, and you might have also noticed the very high levels of education. Um, so it was a, a function of um, where we were, where we were geographically. But absolutely, it would be great to have a larger sample size with a more diverse sample. So a Amy, of course, that was great, and I didn't think anything would be as good as you could do it. So I wonder, though, if you would take this study and then would extend it out more time and then flip the conditions, yeah. because yes. obviously then you'd have more evidence to do it. So do you think people would stay at it for a month? That a very interesting question is whether people persisted in the, in the exercise beyond the 14 days. We didn't ask them to keep on doing it. We wanted to see what would happen. And when we spoke to them in those follow-up interviews, we asked them, do you still write down your three good things and why they happened? And only one person said he was still doing it to the point of writing it down. Everyone else said, no, not really. Um, I think about it once in a while, but I stopped writing it down. And then the six, we'd had a six-week follow-up, and the beneficial effects from mood were no longer present. It was only, we saw the beneficial effects only while they were doing the practice. So did you load money every day on that Amazon card? Um, every, about every week. Oh, so every week, OK. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So we waited. We had several people in the study in different stages, and around once or twice a week, we would put through the, what we had to do paperwork-wise to reload the card. So you mentioned that the particip participants rated low on depression and anxiety symptoms. Um, did you specifically choose to exclude dual diagnosis? And do you think that would change the results? No, we didn't look to exclude dual diagnosis. If the person was psychiatrically stabilized, then they, they could come into the study. And we didn't have to exclude anyone for that reason. Uh, we excluded people because they weren't alcohol primary. That was the only reason we had to exclude, any, exclude anyone. So I'm kind of interested in your uh, outcome variable. So um, the outcome variable was assessed right after they finished those three questions. Yes. So, so they kind of reminded of us three good things. Yes. And then also they kind of recorded that they're Mood. That's right. Okay. 
We used the Panis instrument, which asked about, it was 23 um, moods, and they rated the extent to which they felt each mood at that moment, at, right at that moment. So do you think that there might be some reason why the effects of uh, the intervention is gone? Because it's right after you thinking about gratitude yeah. that your mood must kind of elevate it. Yes, that's right. Huh? So that six weeks later at the follow-up, we didn't see the same um, uh, effects. I think I have, it, my question is an extension of Myung's a little bit, has to do with the connection between mood and sobriety, I guess, and whether or not you yes. have plans to follow up and investigate that as well as the, the um, duration or the effect of the positive mood? It's an excellent question because positive mood can actually be a relapse trigger for some people. So the question of um, assessing mood as an outcome for people with addictions is more complicated. So it's a very interesting question, and I'm thinking about at least writing uh, something about that. Uh, um, Positive psychology literature um, and research seems to say that positive mood has no downside. Positive mood is only great. It's only positive. There's no, there's no dark underside to that. But if you read the relapse prevention literature in the addictions field, primarily predictors of relapse have to do with negative mood. But for some, positive mood precipitates relapse. People start to feel good, they start to feel euphoric, and then they want to use substances. So that's why, partly why I wanted to measure two dimensions of positive mood. And I wasn't surprised that the feeling calm and serene uh, uh, appeared to have, uh, gratitude appeared to have an effect on feeling calm and serene. It had no effect on feeling euphoric, feeling, you know, um, feeling uh, um, energized and that kind of thing. And so I don't know if we can conclude that feeling calm and serene is a, is a helpful positive mood. It's a kind of positive mood that won't hurt someone in recovery, whereas the other mood, the more activated mood, might be a little more dangerous. I don't think we can say that, but it is a question that has gone through my head and something I've thought about. What was your dropout rate? It was, we only had one person drop out. And people participated at an excellent rate. Um, on average, every person missed one, one wave, one of the 14 days. So a few people did it uh, uh, every single time, and a few people missed a couple of times. But overall, participation, acceptability, feasibility were all very high. They liked using the web. We can do one last burning question, if someone has a burning question. <laughs> I dare say you haven't had this many questions since your dissertation defense hearing. <laughs> lots of interest, lots of interest. Thank you so much, My Amy. pleasure. Thank you. Thank you very much. But we have another speaker, and that's Lou Lamarca. Just to remind everyone, he's clinical director of the Community Assessment and Treatment Services, and of course, an MSSA graduate from our school. Hi, everybody. Um, I want to start off by letting you know ahead of time that I'm a virgin. This is my first solo thing. Um, I've, I've participated in panels, but never before by myself. So you're, you're um, part of that with me. Thank you. <laughs> um, and um, when I heard the title of Amy's presentation, it inspired me to uh, think about the application of research because Amy's um, social work practice is um, in conducting research. Mine is in using it. So I use the title to connect us together that way. So I'm going to talk about three good things that we can gain from research and, and use while in practice. And um, before I go into it, though, I just wanted to kind of give a little spiel that I feel real strongly about, which is that, um, and this is going to sound odd at a symposium about research, but research can be overrated. We have to remember that as social workers, our greatest strength is connection. It's, it's our belief in the dignity and worth of everybody and the ability for people to, to recover and optimize and people, um, groups, communities, et cetera. And research helps us 
and how to do that, but we should never lose sight of doing that. And that's something I think that we should all take pride of. Um, I'm very proud to be a social worker. I hope you are. Um, if you're not, do it. Get proud <laughs> and, 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 and do it. Because we, 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 we do, that, that's what sets us apart from the other professions, is, is that, that recognition and ability, because it's a skill. To, to connect to people, especially um, in the internet age, the, the ability to really connect is, is, is declining. So we need us <laughs> to, to do that. So with that spiel over, um, there's three, three things that I wanted to focus on. Now each of these things could be its own two hour long thing. So this is a very kind of sort of a short survey of some stuff. The first one is protective factors. And when we talk about that, um, the three good things exercise is really going to echo in that. Um, second one is the recovery model, which is kind of the current dominant model of how to deliver behavioral health care services, including um, addiction treatment. And then number three is, is uh, using uh, an, a real life example here from Ohio about how interpreting research can affect practice. So to start off with protective factors, um, I'm going to talk about the brief addiction monitor, which I drive my staff crazy by always going BAM and <laughs> referring to it as the BAM. <laughs> I hit the wrong button. Okay, the BAM is the Brief Addictive Monitor. Um, it was developed by the Center for Excellence in Drug Abuse Treatment and Education in Philadelphia. Um, it intends to measure the effectiveness of chemical dependency treatment by looking at three areas. Use of the chemicals, risk factors, and protective factors. It's a self-report, 17 questions. Um, and it's most commonly used as a pretest at the beginning of a treatment episode and as a post-test at the end of the treatment episode. And then you compare the two. Um, it's considered to have high psychometric properties, meaning that it is, um, the research suggested is both reliable and valid. Um, and most studies, again, suggest that there is high validity and high reliability. So the first factor is the use factor, and that's pretty simple. It's just looking at, did the use of drugs or alcohol go down during the course of the treatment episode? Now the way the BAM is devised is that it only looks at the last 30 calendar days. So uh, at intake, you would ask, the, the, they would ask, answer questions about their use based on the previous 30 days. Now that can be a problem if they were in a protected environment in the past 30 days. So where I work, we frequently get people who come from prison or jail or other environments where, um, where they have very little access to alcohol or drugs. We're not naive enough to think they have no access, but it's, it is limited. So when they answer the question on use, they most commonly say, no use. I've had no use in the last 30 days. So then at the end of the treatment episode, when we ask them, have you used in the last 30 days? They say, no, I haven't. So then that's no use to no use flat line. It implies that that aspect of the treatment was not successful. So for a lot of agencies, this, that particular subscale may not be particularly uh, useful. And also, I should mention that um, in addition to client report, when you use the BAM, you are encouraged to, to back that up by UAs. So if somebody answers that they had no use, but they tested positive, you're going to throw out their self-report answer and, and say there was use. So the next section that the BAM looks at is risk factors. And this looks, there's questions that ask them about behavior that they do that is associated with AOD use. So it addresses access to alcohol and drugs, um, spending time with friends or relatives who use. It looks at um, how much unstructured free time they have. Uh, it looks at um, uh, whether or not there's a, a written relapse prevention plan or, or some specific identified activities, and it looks at uh, various triggers for use. The third one is protective factors, and this is the one that really drew me to the BAM. There's several different measures you can use, you know, to, to kind of look at outcomes for the effectiveness of alcohol and drug treatment. 
the BAM was one of the few ones that really addressed protective factors. And this is something that as a field, we generally are not very good at looking at protective factors. So this is looking at um, like the absence of drugs and alcohol. It's looking at um, connections with sober people. It looks at structured free time. So it's kind of the opposite of the risk factors. And what I like about this is that it's, um, it's empowering. It's, it's positive. It's, it fits in nicely with the um, positive psychology um, that Amy was talking about. Um, an example of a protective factor could be doing the three good things exercise. It it's, um, fits in with the recovery model, which I, I'll, I'll flip over in a few minutes and start talking about that. And you'll see how, how consistent it is with that model. Um, and I kind of jumped ahead in this. The protective factors, it's rarely examined. It's strengths-based. It's solution-focused. It's empowering. Um, it's concrete. It's attainable. It's consistent with evidence-based practices. And what I found with my staff is that once we started using the BAM, it kind of forced them to look at these things. And I started seeing protective factors in treatment plans and in um, discharge um, aftercare plans and, and instructions for follow-up. So it really had a, a little bit of a ripple effect at our agency. And it kind of, um, without this, I don't know that we would have been on task to incorporate protective factors into our treatment. So here's an example from our, from our, from our, our agency. Um, Based on the quantitative data that, that we have, we define a successful treatment episode by two factors. Number one, um, the client is abstinent as measured by 30 consecutive days of negative UAs. So that means if somebody's in treatment for 27 days and they test positive to successfully complete the program, they have to have at least 30 more days. It starts back at zero. So we're looking at consecutive days of no use. The other thing is we look at recidivism and crime. We're, um, we are also, part of our funding is through the Ohio Department of Rehabilitation and Correction. So we look at um, recidivism and, and work to lower recidivism rates. So the other factor is, is that they have no new arrests. So once the treatment episode starts, they can still successfully complete if they get arrested on a previous activity, so something they did before the treatment episode. But if it's behavior that, and charges that are new after the treatment episode started, then they cannot successfully complete. So based on those two criteria, 66% of our clients um, uh, had an increase in protective factors. So that, that those two criteria are how they got to be considered a successful client. So that's sort of the first filter. Of those people, 66% of them had an increase in protective factors. So then, just like the mixed methods study that Amy talked about um, for, for her research, we also included some qualitative data. And we interviewed clients during on their last day of treatment about the specific nature of their protective factors. And that's how it came to know how we knew what to start incorporating into treatment plans and what to put in aftercare plans. They told us, and they said, this is what worked for me. This is, this is so it wasn't just protective factors. We're now aware of specific protective factors that work, factors that work for our population. Um, so we, um, we incorporated that. We trained our counselors to incorporate that into our treatment plans. And then after 90 days of this, our success rates increased by 8%, um, which means that the, the pool of people who successfully completed rose by 8%. And then within those individuals who successfully completed, it went from 66% to 72% had an increase in protective factors. So we saw some positive results based on this scale. So then to flip gears to um, the first good thing then is, is that protective factors are, are, are good. And we, I encourage you to really think about that and incorporate that into your practice. So then the second thing, the second good thing I wanted to talk about was the recovery model. So the past model of addiction treatment um, was 
what I found was it was called the Minnesota model, but I can't find out why it was called the Minnesota model. Do you know? I think because it was developed at Hazleton in Minnesota. Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, and what the, the Minnesota model was, was prevalent. Um, model for addiction treatment. And this model, there was very little difference between addiction treatment and 12-step processes. Basically, all you needed to do to be an addiction counselor was to have your own history of addiction. And then you used your personal um, recovery experience to coach people into their own recovery. An element of that is, is that it was um, often um, aggressive, confrontational. Think of the classic intervention where you sit someone down and really like kind of, uh, could, it could be interpreted as shaming someone in, into, into treatment. Um, it's based on the idea that you as the provider are an expert and you're going to tell this person how to get better. So there was, um, very little difference. It was based, the definition was sustained abstinence. It was very much focused on absolutely no use of alcohol and drugs at all. Um, again, very, very directive. So then what happened, there was a transition period where after a while, funders started asking, this looks like a 12-step meeting. Why am I paying for this? And they could get this for free down at the church, down the street. I'm not paying for this anymore. At the same time, um, behavioral health care outcomes started to get researched. So that's referring primarily to, to the mental health field, where at the same time that funders were starting to question what they were paying for for addiction treatment, on the mental health side of things, there was an expectation, prove to us this works. You're, you're doing, we, um, this coincided at the time of deinstitutionalization. So we were taking people out of the psychiatric hospitals, placing them in the community, the rise of case management. A lot of money was being thrown into community mental health services at that point. And then again, funders wanted to know, is this working? Um, show us some outcomes. Um, best practices were developed based on research. Um, and it kind of moved away from just sort of personal experience and personal anecdotes to, to quantitative data. Um, and as a result, the addictions field became more professional. You, you needed to have licensure. Um, and there was different expectations. So today then, the primary model is the recovery model. And the recovery model is based on the simple concept that recovery is possible. And what that means specifically is that recovery is very individualistic. For somebody, recovery might be 100% abstinence. For somebody else, recovery might be less use or smarter use, um, it, kind of similar to and, and consistent with the idea of a harm reduction model. The recovery model works for both abstinence and harm reduction. It challenges us to find out what is best for that specific individual and what recovery looks like for them. And the idea is everyone has potential to recover. Everyone has um, the, the, the potential to maximize their life. And depending on their, their personality, their specific symptomology, that's going to be very different from person to person. A key element of the recovery model is that we are no longer the experts. We consider the person in recovery, striving for recovery, to be the expert. The idea is that everybody knows themselves better than we can know them, and that they have the ability to recover within. It's part of their human spirit. And our job is not to tell them what to do. Our job is to encourage them and empower them to find out what to do. Very, very different approach. And um, let's see where are we. And then the use of evidence practices, evidence-based practices, is important because the, the evidence-based practices is how we elicit that empowerment, how we encourage them, and, and how we get them going. And um, in that sort of, that is now the key thing that differentiates treatment from peer support. And, and I should add, not not to suggest that peer support in 12 steps does not work, or to say that there's not evidence to, to, to back it up, but simply to say that it is considered 
now completely different from treatment. So the rise of the recovery model is intertwined with the rise of evidence-based practices for addiction. They, they, they go hand in hand and ro rows together. Um, the recovery model mirrors motivational interviewing. It's also consistent with cognitive behavior therapy and it's consistent with solution-focused therapy. Probably the three most predominant heavily researched models that we have right now. Um, and the AOD field, addictions field, has now become an accepted profession. We, we can now point to data, we can point to research, we can, um, it, it's no longer just a sober person telling somebody else to get sober, which certainly still remains a part of the field. There's a lot of people in recovery who are attracted to help others and achieve their own recovery. But it, there, there is, it's now recognized as, as a profession. So that recovery model is the, the, the second good thing. It shows how you can use research to have better outcomes and, and to improve treatment for people. So then the third one I want to talk about is knowing how to interpret research. And I'm going to talk about therapeutic communities. <coughs> so what is a therapeutic community? It is a group-based uh, therapy in which group members identify and target each other's behaviors and hold each other accountable for their own actions. This is a grossly simplified <laughs> explanation of what a therapeutic community is. Um, but it, it's the idea of, they refer to themselves as, as a family. Um, and they grow within the family and have specific rules. They keep each other on task. They pull each other up. They push each other up. They hold each other accountable. And the thought is, is by holding my brother accountable, I'm going to have to start holding myself accountable. Um, change occurs because members use each other to test and subsequently change their thinking patterns. That's how a, a CBT specialist would, would translate it. Um, uh, group members reward and reinforce each other and are influenced by each other's progress. That's how a, a social learning person would, would translate it. So kind of mixed in the theoretical underpinnings of a therapeutic community, um, CBT, cognitive behavior therapy, the thought that thinking affects behavior. Um, because the group members that are going to challenge their brothers and sisters on their thinking, although they may not necessarily use those words, that's what they're doing. Um, social learning, they, they learn by observing. They see somebody get pulled up, so they think, oh, I don't want to do that. I'm, gonna, uh, I'm not going to do that and start changing their own behavior based on observation. And family systems uh, theory, in which that interactions with each other prompts change. It's not necessarily the interaction between the provider and the consumer. It's the interaction between the consumer and the other consumer. Um, again, the, the family thing. Um, in a true therapeutic community, the providers are considered part of the family. They're, 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 there's very little distinction between them as a provider, so much as them maybe being an older brother. So all of those therapeutic underpinnings have been thoroughly researched. Um, there's considerable data to support all of them. Um, a version of a therapeutic community is a modified therapeutic community. Uh, and that is a, a therapeutic community that is targeting uh, dual diagnosed people with mental illness and addiction. That specific modification is on NREP, the National Registry for Evidence-Based Practices, um, which is operated through SAMHSA. So these are the, the um, according to NREP, based on the modified therapeutic community, these are the five areas that they studied and showed positive outcomes for. Uh, substance use, criminal behavior, psychological problems, employment, economic benefit, and housing stability. For our purposes, we're going to focus on substance use. And in Ohio, that was the main focus. Therapeutic communities were funded by um, ODATIS, the Ohio Department of Alcohol and Drug Addiction Services, which is now merged 
with Ohio Department of Mental Health to be Ohio Mass, Ohio Mental Health and Addiction Services. But when, when Ohio was funding therapeutic communities, primarily it was through ODOTUS. Um, so what happened here then is a study came out, therapeutic community in a California prison, treatment outcomes after five years. This was published in 2011. In it, they looked at 395 adult males who were incarcerated in a substance abuse treatment facility and they were participating in a therapeutic community program. Therapeutic communities are frequently in prisons. That, that's, it's, um, when they first started, they, were, they tended to be like in rural communities, sort of like a farm or a standalone place. Over time, they came to be um, special units within a prison. Um, so it, it, it looked at um, 403 adult males. They were all incarcerated at the same place. They were matched for similar uh, characteristics. So what they looked at is the number of days before returning to prison. So once they successfully completed the therapeutic community and were released from prison, how long was it before they had to go back to prison? And then if they did, how many days were they in prison? They looked at arrest rates, misdemeanors, felonies, combined both, new arrests, and they also looked at the type of offenses. So what they found, or what they asked, during a five-year period, did the therapeutic community program effectively reduce recidivism? Did all these things go down? And so, uh, well, we don't need that. <laughs> um, I want to jump ahead to the, um, the findings. This is, this is the meat of it. So what they found is, is that therapeutic communities were not effective. Their research suggested that going to a therapeutic community increased your chances of getting arrested again. It increased your chances of being in prison. It increased the number of days you would spend in prison. Um, so it contradicted previous research suggesting that therapeutic communities worked. I mean, remember, this, is, this was on na the National Registry of Evidence-Based Practices. There's a body of research saying it works. Now this comes out and says, oh no, we were wrong, it doesn't work at all. Um, and there have been other studies that, that looked at a one-year rate of, of recidivism. This was a five-year rate of recidivism, including studies in Ohio. So the big question then is, is why? What happened? Why, why do therapeutic communities no longer work? So these are some of the strengths of the study and saying why we should consider this to be a good study. I use quantitative data from a reliable source. The recidivism rates come from, the, it came from the state of uh, California's database. Like when someone gets arrested, they get into that database. You're not relying on someone's memory saying, oh yeah, he was, he, he got, I think he was arrested in June. This, this, is, this is quantifiable data. Um, the control group in the study and the, um, uh, variable group were matched. So other than the participation in the therapeutic community, everything else was matched. So that, that kind of reduces possibilities of other factors being at play here. Um, it was consistent with the other recent studies, including the one from Ohio, and it was a large sample size and participation rate. The limitations of the study um, is the studies that ended up being on the National Registry of Evidence-Based Practices were studies of the modified therapeutic community. This study was therapeutic communities in general that were not modified. So it's not quite apples and oranges, but it's maybe a green apple compared to a red apple. It's, it's not quite the same. And then this is the big thing, what we found. The study did not address fidelity. Before we realized this though, Across the country, including in Ohio, we cut off funding for therapeutic communities. All the therapeutic communities in Ohio closed, and people no longer had that as a treatment 
um, option for themselves. Um, so people in prisons were not getting that treatment anymore. It was no longer an option because we thought it didn't work. Um, people, us, social workers who work in therapeutic communities lost their jobs because the funding went away. After all this happened, then someone said, oh, hey, let's look closer. And that's when they found that this study did not address fidelity to the therapeutic community modality. So what we found then, since 2011, additional research has been done. And the additional research factors fidelity into it. When they factored fidelity into it and looked at um, just therapeutic communities that had high fidelity rates, guess what? They work. <laughs> so the problem was is, is these were not, these were therapeutic communities, but they weren't really good therapeutic communities. The fidelity was low. So this speaks to number one, the importance of fidelity to your, um, your model and your, your program. And number two, the importance of, and my main point is, is how important it is to know how to understand research and how to interpret it. If this would have been picked up on when it was first published, many more people could have benefited from participating in a therapeutic community. Now what's happened now in Ohio is, is now with the new research you know, that, that addresses for fidelity, there is funding again for therapeutic communities. But the climate's different. Um, it's, it's, the, the, the problem now is, is that funding has been restored for therapeutic communities, but now instead of the funding primarily coming from alcohol and drug, it's coming from criminal justice, and there's elements of therapeutic communities that criminal justice does not like. So it's forcing a modification to the therapeutic community, which makes no sense to me because we know what happened is, is when you had low fidelity, you did not have good outcomes. So now they're funding it, but forcing low fidelity onto it. So the next batch of research is going to go back to saying it's not effective, and they're going to be defunded again. It's madness. So research is the class you hated the most, right? <laughs> Um, but it's important to know that the, the research, it has real effects. And th th that's, that's the good thing. It's not just a wasted class. <laughs> it's not just that thing that, that lowered your GPA. <laughs> like it, is, it has very, very real effects on, on, on outcomes for people. Um, it has very real effects on um, uh, funding, has real effects on um, jobs. Like I said, people lost their jobs when these were um, uh, defunded. And, it's important to know how to read and then interpret research. So I encourage master's programs, I encourage Mandel to, when they design their research courses, to really think about that piece, to really teach us how to interpret research. Um, I think research classes are, are very good at teaching how to do research. Perhaps I would suggest an element to those classes of how to interpret the research, you know, how to, We'll go to a journal, read the article, and kind of have a good sense of whether or not there's high fidelity, whether or not the sampling size is good, et cetera. So uh, th that, that's an important piece of it. Um, I put my contact information there because I have to go to Columbus at 5 o'clock and won't be mingling around, so if anyone had wanted anything. And before I finish, I also wanted to, on a completely different subject, I just wanted to do a plug for um, a Stand Up Day, which is Saturday, November 14th. For those of you who don't know what it is, which I would suspect is all of you, <laughs> um, it's um, standup.org is a charity founded by Ben Cohen, who is a retired rugby player from the UK. He lost his father when his father um, got involved with, in a fight where um, somebody was being bullied for being gay. And his father stuck up and intervened. And as a result of the injuries he sustained, died. So since he is retired, retired he's devoted his life to uh, anti-bullying efforts. And he goes around the world and he gets people together to talk and he encourages dialogue. It started off specifically to anti-gay bullying, but as it's grown, it is basically any kind of bullying. And November 14th is the day he's designated for us to be conscious of bullying efforts 
Um, so there's a great website called standup.org that you can go to that um, talks about the different outreaches they do and the programs they operate. It's a very transparent agency with all of the uh, financial things reported out so you know where, where money's going. They sell t-shirts and stuff. So uh, since we're close to November 14th, I wanted to plug that very um, worthwhile thing. And also it gave me an excuse to not wear a tie that I could just <laughs> do that. <laughs> so. Thank you, Lou. We have some time for questions. Could you please uh, explain the fidelity elements that we're not kept to? I'm not quite sure like what the difference is and what that would mean. Uh, yes, that's a, a good question. Specifically, um, one of the crucial elements of a therapeutic community is that the different members of the community have specific roles. And within those roles, that's, how, that's part of the way they keep each other accountable. And you start with, with roles in terms of simple things like, like housekeeping and chore assignment and all that. And then you kind of can raise through the ranks until you become an expediter. And the expediter kind of serves as a liaison between the staff and the community. And the expediter sort of expedites the community. They're chosen by the community. Uh, with staff approves it, but, but they're chosen by the community. In the, the particular therapeutic communities they were looking at, the expediter position was just giving as a reward for someone who um, volunteered to mop the floor. Uh, they, they, they weren't really looking at the purpose of the expediter position. They also were, because it was in a criminal justice system, the expediter, the therapeutic community has roles where they like pull somebody up or they push somebody up, meaning um, they have daily morning motivation meetings and they have daily closure meetings where the community gets together and they will um, pull each other up by saying, hey, so-and-so walked away from a fight, so I want to, I, let's, let's, you know, applaud him and then give a round. And then they say, so-and-so didn't clean his bunk. He was supposed to clean his bunk, but he didn't. They hold each other accountable and they push that person up. They weren't, they didn't have the morning motivation, they had the morning motivation, but they didn't have the closure meetings and they weren't given that daily recognition and reinforcement of it. I was surprised, Lou, that one study would have such devastating consequences across the country for a treatment modality that had been, that had good evidence up until that point. I wonder what your thoughts are about why that one study had such a disproportional impact on programs across the country. One study could be poorly done or just wrong for some reason. I think the timing of the study occurred at a point where um, in 2011, it corresponds to a time in which we were in love with, we still are, but when we really fell in love with cognitive behavior therapy. And I think anything that was not CBT was given a short shift. And I think that was sort of a bandwagon effect of, look, it's not CBT. But that's just conjecture, I, I, don't, I don't know. I just have a follow-up. So what parts of the program are the jail saying they don't want in at their community? You said they wanted you to change it? What they don't like is the, the, the accountability piece so that if, if we're members of the therapeutic community, I can, if we're, if we're following the model with high fidelity, I can push you up. I can say, you didn't do this, or you, you didn't follow the rules, you, you acted antisocial, and then as a community, we can sanction you. And so that is interpreted as one, to use their words, inmate, because again, we're talking different systems, different attitudes, one inmate having control over an inmate, which is considered a security risk. Okay. And they've extended that to therapeutic communities now are largely, they can still be found in prisons, but more in a community corrections. And so 
even though they're not inmates in the community, the same principle applies. Maybe I'm misunderstanding you, but it would seem to me that the finding would be more accurately described as for the criminal population. Yes. The therapeutic community was not effective because you can't hold therapeutic community variable uh, constant if it's, you know, when you look at the literature on recidivism, it's, for example, when you put juvenile delinquents in a facility where they interface mostly with juvenile delinquents and have therapeutic communities within that, then we see the recidivism rate go up, not down. So how do you, how do you keep that variable from intervening on the fact that it wasn't therapeutic com community, it was therapeutic community of this particular criminal population? Well, now what they're doing is the therapeutic community is now no longer ever going to be isolated as just that as the primary intervention. It's going to be mixed and mingled with the risk principle, which was not around. Well, it was being studied. It wasn't predominant in 2011. You can just say what they discovered is that with this particular population, it's not uh, you need inclusion. You should not isolate them. There should not be a homogeneous population. Well, and so what, happened, what would happen now to address that? The risk principle is a theory, it's the predominant theory associated with recidivism now. And it's a theory that says that you can predict whether or not somebody's going to commit another crime, which is the risk. And then furthermore, you can assess specific needs as to why they will have be a high risk for crime. Mm -hmm. Part of that principle is that high risk individuals should never mix with medium risk or low risk individuals. So as you said, the, um, the low risk individual is never going to have a positive effect and bring the high risk person down. The high risk person is going to poison the low risk person and their chance of recidivism will go up. So now fidelity to that model means you separate by risk. So now if you're following that, the therapeutic community is going to be all high risk or all moderate risk or all low risk. And measure that and determine whether or not therapeutic community works. And that's, that's what, that's our challenge now. You're, you're absolutely correct. That, that's what we need to do to see if you separate by risk. We learned that we have to look at fidelity, obviously, but now if it's in a criminal justice setting, you're right, it's essential. We have to look at risk. What you discovered is what they already knew about risk populations, but not necessarily about therapeutic communities. Exactly. Exactly. And also by limiting the outcome to just recidivism. Um, you know, if we go back, there, there was a slide that showed five areas in which there's data to suggest including recidivism. There's four others, which we haven't looked at. Any other questions for Lou? Okay, great. Okay, thank you so much, Lou and Amy. We have a special gift for you. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Yes. <laughs> We're so grateful to you for coming back to your alma mater and sharing this important information with all of us. And I join Dean Weichel, who, uh, oh, sorry, Dean Gilmore. <laughs> Wrong job. Dean Gilmore, in uh, thanking you again for being here. Just a moment, please. Sorry about that. <laughs> Thank you. And I'm Cleve Gilmore, but uh, <laughs> I certainly don't mind being associated with Mae Weichel, who's a, a great friend and, and leader. Uh, well, I, I really want to thank both uh, Amy and Lou uh, for being here today. What, what great examples of our alumni working in the community and, and really making a difference. I think you, you said that uh, this was your first presentation today, Lou. We're, we're going to have you back yeah. because this was very powerful. And in, in fact, I'm going to suggest that your statement about the importance of paying attention to these research principles in class and holding our feet to the fire and using these examples is something that we need to do. Um, some of you might remember that your research class wasn't your favorite class. Uh, but if we don't follow Lou's advice, that this, is, this is what can happen. Uh, we're, I'm very happy, too, that we have, once again, a, a great session that um, Betsy has put together as part of our Centennial Celebration Series. 
Yeah. And uh, we, you see that uh, we're celebrating the beginning of our uh, centennial, 19, 1915. Community leaders came together to uh, the president and board of trustees at the university and said, we need help. And the university responded. And today we have a school that is deep into the community. We're not an ivory tower. We're here, we're working in the community. We have these celebrations where we can look at great research and great practice being, being done. But every day our students and our faculty are out there and most importantly, our alumni are out there carrying on the, this great work. So I want, our celebration is really about you and what you're doing in the community and I wanna thank you for that. And I think we have a little reception afterwards, yes. And we have a little reception, so stick around. And I'm sure the, our great speakers will be happy to talk with you some more. Thank you.